It is great to have you here. Congratulations. Thank you. Nice to see you. Uh, I watched much of the ceremony. 55,000 fans showed up just to congratulate you at the Hall of Fame. You you had that kind of reception when you were playing, but to have that now, what what was the weekend like? What did it feel like? What were some of your takeaways? The weekend was amazing. Busy, but it was amazing. Oh, my God. I mean, the biggest thing just in front of the fans, but when we were just the Hall of Famer just alone, wow. You were like a, a kid in a candy store. Yeah. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Guys that you grew up watching that you wanted to meet and, and mm-hmm. share with them. You know, only you only see them for a little bit when they come to the fields or when you go to their place where they used to play, you know, the organization that they belong. And But when I had them for a good two hours, sitting, eating, shouting, seeing the way they are. But also, you now you're one of them. I'm you're one of in them. that group. You know, thank God, thank God. And the way it started, not like most Hall of Famers, typically being a first draft pick or having success or long success, a lot of your teammates and everything from the beginning, even though there might have been a little struggle, none quite like yours, starting off in the majors as a starter, realize it's more difficult, then you go to the bullpen. How much more is it satisfying to see, knowing your journey and how it started with the struggle? It's definitely satisfying, you know, it's gratifying. It's, it's everything beyond that because, I mean, uh, I mean, as a big leaguer, you come to the big leagues, I mean, a boy, a boy from Panama, you know, little did I know the language and none of that stuff. So when I came and, uh, you know, they took me out of the star, but they put me in the bullpen. I didn't care, Chris. I just wanted to be in the big leagues, regardless. And then, you know, I was blessed that I have the opportunity to be as a long reliever. I did good, I would say, you know. And then in 96, Mr. Torrey put me in the bullpen as a long reliever. And within a month, I was a settlement. That year, we accomplished something special. You know, won the first the first time since I don't know when. And then I uh, became the New York Yankees closer. I mean, in 97. <laughs> Weeks after, I was struggling, and Mr. Torrey, like I said, I said before, Mr. Torrey says, Moreno, as long as I am the manager, you will be my closer. Mm-hmm. Come on, if I struggle and I don't do good, I know that my it will be somewhere <laughs> else. Yeah. You know, but the Lord gave me after after that meeting, within uh, uh, ten days, something like that, He gave me the the face, the best picture there is in baseball, the quarter. You know. It's not like someone teach it to me. He gave it to me. And, guys, I was trying to make that ball stop from moving because I had no control. I was afraid. I got no control of the pitch. You just came up with it on accident. No, it wasn't an accident. It was a gift by God. When It's it's something that uh, I have to learn how to use it. And I used it for 17 years. The only thing that I didn't do was this, guys. I didn't tell the guys, hey, guys, verbally, here it comes. But the they quarter. knew. Right. But they knew. And they Seven couldn't do it. Years, they couldn't hit it. I mean, you're talking about, think about, this is a miracle. Why I say that? Because we have the best of the best here in the United States. All over the world, they come here to play. And the best of the best, if they know a pitch coming, I guarantee you guys, they will hit it hard with authority. Yeah. Okay. They knew that that pitch was coming for 17 years. And, and, and no one could get it. Mm-hmm. And that's, I mean, that's how you have a 2.2 career ERA, which that alone will get you in the Hall of Fame. But when you cut that down by 70%, 0.7 postseason ERA, it, it seems impossible. The 141 innings pitch, I think you'll have two home runs ever in the playoffs. All those playoff years. Why do you think you were already at this level of A-plus excellence somehow raised your game in the biggest spots in the postseason in those championship moments? I believe that uh, the game alone will dictate how how you will raise your game because, I mean, you're talking about playoff first, and then you're talking about championship, and then World Series. So that alone, to me, not too many people had the opportunity to be there. So when I was there, I said, man, I had to do whatever it takes to bring it home, whatever it takes. You know, my my my... My responsibility is just save those games regardless. Right. You know, and bring the best of you. They always will bring 
the best out of you. Mariano, it's one thing to be a devastating pitcher, but to be able to do it on a stage like the biggest market in the country for one of the biggest teams like the Yankees. You started in a small fishing village in Panama. You came up. You got sent back down with Jeter that one year. I think it was in 95. Yeah, 95 then you yeah. come back up and you just dominate with the Yankees under Steinbrenner. I would imagine the bright lights in big city at some point felt a little tough or pressured for you to manage, but somehow you didn't feel it at all. What, what was that like and how much did that help shape your career? I mean, that was great, though. You, you, you bring a point that is special to me because, I mean, to me, do it in New York was the best blessing yeah. that I ever have. Because, I mean, if you do it in New York, you do it anywhere else. You know, and New York is the, is the pinnacle. Is, is the, the greatest challenge there is for an athlete to succeed. Okay, you mentioned it. You have all these things, the city, all these things, you know. It will eat your life. But I was able, thank God, to manage that, you know. First of all, I didn't stay in the city. You know, I went away from the city. Right. I, I love the city, but I went away from the city. I went to Westchester County. Mm -hmm. I went to New Rochelle. Mm -hmm. You know, I stayed there, love it. You know, the water, the fishing, all that stuff. I love that. So I stayed there, you know. I didn't read no paper, I didn't see no news, none of that stuff. You know, I just went to my business. I know what I did. I don't have to sit on, on TV. I don't, have, I don't need to tell one to tell me, oh, man, you did. I know exactly what I did. You know, for therefore, I mean, if you stay within yourself, know who you are, know who you believe in the abilities that he has given you, you believe on, I was okay with that. You know, mm -hmm. the rest is just... Yeah. Mar Mariano, you were the first and last something very important in MLB history. First, obvious, player ever voted in unanimously. A lot of people thought that would never happen, that some writer would always leave someone off because Babe Ruth wasn't unanimous. But you were the first. But you were also the last player who's ever going to wear number 42, whoever wore Jackie Robinson's number. You were grandfathered in after it had been retired by entirety of Major League Baseball. Why was that important to you? But for me, I mean, what well, Mr. Jackie Robinson represent, and that was part of my speech. But my post, my speech was getting too long, and I had to cut it short because I mean, I mean, to me, number 42 represents a lot. You know, this is a man that gave everything for baseball, basically his life, for us to open a door, for us to come in. Okay, he did that for us, and then the challenge was that uh, you know the legacy that he's giving, you know, for me to have that number and continuing was a blessing, a challenge. Okay, the blessing was, you know, who represent. The number was taken out of baseball. Mm. Now, I'm a challenge with, my, okay, what we do with what I have, okay? That was given to me. I didn't ask for the number. The, the number was given to me. Basically, the number shoots me, all right? Now, what I do with that, that was a challenge. And I wanted to be the best that I could be for Mr. Jackie Robinson to extend his legacy, not my legacy, his legacy, his number, you know, his name. And that's what I'm proud of. You know, that if someone would have been alive, they want, I want him to be alive because my grandpa or Mr. George Steinbrenner was Mr. Jackie Robinson. We're fortunate to have you on the show. Thank you, especially after being so enshrined last week. But I haven't seen an interview where you have not thanked God or leaned on your faith. You talked about being here in New York. You talked about your cutter being a gift from God. There's a legacy in sports that I believe is going away. Very few athletes now talk about their faith or their connection to their faith. Athletic ability is a gift from God. What you do with the athletic ability is your gift back to him, and none has been better than you. You've been a great example, Kurt Warner, Reggie White, and others. What has that meant to you to be able to utilize this platform to be able to express your faith? I mean, I don't know if people, athletes, are afraid of expressing themselves, but, uh, you know, my advice or is that, uh, you know, the Lord gave you the ability, the talent. We, yeah, we, we use it, you know, but the glory goes to him, not to us. You know, he gave us the opportunity to shine. He gave us the earth to breathe, you know. So, therefore, everything, everything, my faith is everything. Everything that, I, that had to do with me had to be with faith. Because if not, well, what I'm doing here. You know, so I'd encourage everybody to just breathe free and speak about your relationship with your Lord. You know, because there's nothing, nothing wrong with that. Right. That's my belief. That's what I believe. And sure. that's what I stand for.
Uh, Mariano, you did something that a lot of players today don't get a chance to do. You got to come up with a group of friends and then stay on one team for a long time. And they weren't just anybody. They were guys like Derek Jeter and Jorge Posada, Tina Martinez, Andy Pettit. You, you all sort of came up around the same time you played together. 2020, Derek Jeter has a chance to get in. Do you think he'll be unanimously voted into the Hall so. of Fame? I hope so. I hope so, man. If, that, if it is my vote, <laughs> he will be unanimous to me. Oh, he is already in my book. So, I mean, uh, 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 I hope so. I don't, I don't doubt it, you know. But, again, you know, it's, it's such a thin line that uh, some people, oh, because I don't like how he work, I don't want to vote for him. Right. You know, that's, that's, Did that's that, the So thing. were you, know, you surprised? Like, every, listen, I know you're a very humble man, but you knew you were going to be in, in the Hall of Fame. How surprised were you that you were unanimous, that nobody said, ah, closers today, they don't know nine out saves? I mean, how, how surprised were you when you got that news? I, I thought that it would be like 99 point something, but mm -hmm. one person will be saying, ah, but <laughs> when they said 25, I mean, 425 voters unanimously, I mean, that, I, was, I was surprised. I was, and, and to me, it was a blessing. Tell us about the foundation, the Mariano Rivera Foundation. Well, the Mariano Rivera Foundation was created in 1998 to support those less fortunate boys and girls, less fortunate, they, they, they don't have much. So uh, we believe in give back. We believe that, I, I remember, you mentioned Puerto Camito, Panama. Sure. You know, I, I, my father was a fisherman and we didn't have much. I had to invent my glove. I had to invent my baseball. I had to invent my bat. Yeah. So the, all that stuff, you know, I mean, when, when I was in the big leagues in 98, I wasn't making any money. A little bit, but not much, okay? But I believe that we need to do something to give back to the community. Mm -hmm. And that's why we created the Mariano Rivera Foundation, to give back. And now, my biggest challenge right now, that will be my 653 safe. Oh. <laughs> because I wanted to build a learning center in New Rochelle for mm -hmm. those boys and girls, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, I believe that if we do that, we're gonna help as many child that we can, you Good know, make you. them right, you know, believe that they can do someone different because a lot of people point their fingers and then and tag them. They say, you're not good for anything. You know, well, I was one of those boys. Yeah. The people say, even in my hometown, people say, you're not good for anything, you know? But we're here talking about Hall of Fame. The same way that I'm t we're talking about, those boys and those girls can be one day talking about maybe from the presidency. Mm -hmm. You don't know. Yeah. So that's my reason why I create the Merano Rivera Foundation create this, this T-shirt. This, this has my story. On the number 42, on the number four, is from Puerto Caimito all the way to my town and then to New York. Yankee Stadium, five championships, Cooperstown. But you see the dove in the right? Mm -hmm. That's the Holy Spirit. Yes. Touching me there in Cooperstown. And here in Panama, where I was born. Congratulations. I appreciate that. Thank you. That's a good gift. Congratulations. This is the first gift. Yes. You, so you got more of these? That'll fit you. you. That'll probably you fit me more. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from First Things First, or go watch a few segments from our other shows on FS1.